Welcome back to Kiss My Ash Radio. I am Adam K. the Brewmeister. With me, of course, the wonderful Honest Abe and the lovely Lady M. And we are here talking to Armand Asante. And Armand, once again, thank you for being here. Thank you. And before we went to break, you know, we were kind of talking about how the, the process of what you did to learn about Gotti and uh, all the <laughs> research you did. But I, th- I think I wanted to delve into slightly more of that. I mean, what is your process like to get into a character? What is it? What is it you do to just find the soul and the arc of where you need to be to make this person come alive on screen? The principal obligation really is to study the author and to understand what the author wants to uh, his point of view. And uh, once you do that, then it's your job to embody what, the, in a sense, the author does. So, so I mean. In, The process involves, I mean, I personally, I document constantly, I I photograph constantly, I interview constantly, I have an an incredible library of interviews, I've made documentaries on subjects. Your your principal obligation is to embody what you're doing, and the more more you can actually, uh, what I call putting it into my DNA, um, that's really the obligation. Do you, um, many of your characters you've portrayed have been tough guy roles or a man's man, so to speak. Do you relate easily to these types of characters or, you know? You know, I, I found that it became more uh, of a stereotypical, you do it well and they, they hunt and type. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they type cast you that, but I mean, uh, I've done, um, I did a film a couple of years ago on uh, based on Irving Yalom's uh, uh, incredible book. Uh, when Nietzsche wept, I played Nietzsche. That, that was a, a process where I actually hire, hired a German translator of Nietzsche to comprehend the right. vernacular and the nomenclature of what Nietzsche's philosophy really was. I mean, it was a tremendous effort to embody that type of character, but the thing is, that's really the obligation. So, I mean, I've been blessed in my life to have an enormous array of material submitted to me, and still, I mean, all I do, and I'm principally all, uh, any actor who's um, who's trying to, um, you know, continue in that, in that field of work, you spend the majority of your year looking for stories. Mm-hmm. It's all about story. Lady M's a big Nietzsche fan. She reads a lot of Nietzsche. <laughs> Nietzsche all day long. <laughs> Why? Don't do that. Well, <laughs> Put me on the spot. That, that which kills you will only make you stronger. <laughs> you know, you've never read Thus Back Zarathustra? <laughs> I actually, is that Nietzsche or Kierkegaard? I can't I even remember. My philosophy 101 now is getting jumbled in my head. Yeah. Very, very famous philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, listen, how did your passion for cigars begin? And what, how did you develop at one point? Because, I mean, I know you personally and you're an avid cigar connoisseur and fan. And when did it start? Probably in the uh, early 80s. Um, and I, 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 um, I just enjoyed the taste of cigars. Um, Who gave I, you I, first I certainly, I'm not an addictive person but uh, probably the first one was something like a denobly or something like that oh, probably wow. in the 80s but okay, the point of eastwood now that you mention it he he was a big denobly fan yeah i think it's from all those josie all will the, jos, the, josie exactly, will movies he's making exactly all those john houston <laughs> films but but you know the um the truth of the matter is i enjoyed the taste of tobacco and, and then the 90s cigars became you know, much more, um, if you will, available yeah. to um, the public, and I, I took a serious interest in it. I um, I smoked off and on. I'm not an addictive personality. There's nothing I get addicted to, and and also I will say this. You know, if, if you smoke anything, you should hit 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 a steam room or a sauna or a facility really quickly. I mean, I, I don't I don't do anything that harms my body. But I think there's a tremendous misconception right now, especially in in lieu of the new FDA rulings that that cigars are necessarily damaging to your body. I think cigars are smoked in moderation by adults. Yeah. They're phenomenal. I mean, uh, cigars are like smoking great, uh, drinking great, great wine mm-hmm. or great, great staple products that are part of our, our own cultural legacy internationally. So I, I take a little umbrage when people lump cigars in with, with cigarettes or any product that uh, is necessarily dangerous. It's not my experience of that industry at all. Whatsoever. Well, I mean, it, the whole basis of that whole FDA ruling, and I'm going to get a little bit more into that later, but it's the Family Prevention Act, the Family Tobacco. I mean, that's what they're saying is to stop kids and protect families from tobacco. It's just such a farce, and they, they really have no clue what they're regulating, and then that's the problem. It's it's a sellout. It's big money. Big money tobacco is moving them to make decisions that's going to benefit their marketplace, and that's, that's what's really going on in the world. Yeah. Um, in many of your films, you're a cigar smoker. Uh, on the Beach, Hoffa, Passion in Paradise, Gotti, Mambo Kings, Two for the Money, American Gangster. You know, I'm sure I probably missed some, but 
Uh, were cigars often written into the role, or was that a prop that you'd often bring yourself into the character? No, several several of those films, the cigar, cigar was written into the role. You'd be amazed at how many directors have actually asked me, would you would you smoke a cigar in the scene? You know, in, in half of that was never in the script, but I mean, uh, Danny DeVito insisted on it. It's, it's an interesting phenomenon, but, but I think probably because of the uh, filmic and cinematic illusion that cigar people are necessarily powerful people. And I, <laughs> I played characters that that had the illusion of, or were deluded enough to believe they had power. Mm-hmm. But the point is that, that I think that's where that that uh, that pattern uh, evolved. Is it likely for most or some actors or actresses to deny and say, "No, I don't want to be seen with a cigarette, or I don't want to smoke a cigar on on scene"? It's very normal. I mean, yeah. you, you can you can decline anything today. I mean, it, you know, you, you don't so prostitute yourself out there for anything. So. Has anybody ever complained about the smoke on a set that you've worked with? Never. No. No. I That's dare them to. <laughs> <laughs> it's just interesting. I mean, you just joined us. We were speaking with Armand Asante. Armand, what was uh, one of the most memorable cigar-related stories that you could remember on or off the set? Um, I, I think, I think I, I, I've had moments where people have come up to me um, – I actually had a moment here in Florida very recently at the beautiful cigar bar in Weston that's run by the gentleman from uh, Louisiana. Smoke on the water. Yeah, and the guy from Howard Beach who works there gave me a beautiful, uh, beautiful cigar. Um, I have one memory right after Mambo Kings that was amazing. I was here in Miami having dinner uh, in a very low-key place, and this guy came up to me who worked at the restaurant, and he said, I have a gift for you. And I was, what is this? He gave me a pre-Castro cigar that was probably from the fifties. Oh wow! And it was, uh, it was like it was like having a dessert. <laughs> it was like having ice cream. It was amazing. So I will say that legend, uh, that that legacy, that goes back to um, Cuba and Nicaragua and all all the countries that now are the staple industries of cigars, is very powerful. I mean. You know, when oh, you, I, somebody gives you something, you say, that, but that's a bottle of champagne. That yeah, isn't a cigar. Right, yeah, you know? yeah. And a lot of people are still waiting for that door to open so they can have that experience. So yeah. it's mm-hmm. really mind-boggling stuff. But you brought up Mambo Kings, and I know your mother was a, a music teacher. Yep. You had an amazing scene there with Tito Puente and, and, and Mambo Kings. I mean, that's when you were up there playing the drums. Yeah, I and, was a professional drummer for years, and then I didn't know anything about Latin Timbali drumming, and I actually, I actually have film and video of Tito and I rehearsing that for a long time. You actually, from I read a story, you actually did a gig with him. Uh, he asked after that movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah, <laughs> he uh, actually asked me to go on the road. <laughs> but, you know, it was the first time in my life actually that that I had an international offering offerings for films. So I didn't have the time to even consider anything but work. But so, I bet you couldn't imagine that when you were a kid playing you know, drums at Tito. No, no, no. <laughs> but I'll tell you something. It was electrifying. You know, that was one of the most electrifying group of artists uh, ever put together: Celia Cruz, Tito Puente, Gianni Pacheco. Um, so many great uh, Bobby Sanabria. So many great Latin artists worked on that film. And you know, a lot of people don't know that that score was actually perfected. For instance, even even every drum stroke that we did was then retuned. I mean, it's an amazing amount of technical digital work, work went yeah. into the, the construction of that score. Well, I want to get more into that when we come back, but we got to take a break and we come back more with Armand Asante. Make sure you're keeping it lit. 